Welcome to episode 6 in our series on Judaism and animal welfare. And in this episode we're going to analyse the life of Rabbi Avraham Isaac Cook, who was a 20th century rabbi who uh, was born in Latvia and made his way to Israel to become the first pre-state chief rabbi of the then Palestine. Um, he was originally, when he lived in Latvia, he was uh, studying under the Nitziv of Vologin. He was known as a profound mystic, an innovative halachist or adjudicator of Jewish law. He was a prolific writer, he wrote many books and he was a poet. He was modern in the respect that he saw himself as a kind of bridge between two worlds. The old world of Eastern Europe in Vilna and the shtetl and the new world which was um, <clears throat> which where he wanted to uh, dissolve boundaries between the irreligious or secular Jews and the uh, traditional Jews in Israel. And it must have been a very exciting time. He must have felt like he was really on a mission because um, uh, pre-state Israel must have been a fascinating place to uh, be inspired by and he wanted to be this bridge and he was he was uh, very brave it was a very hard thing to do very controversial and sometimes bringing two peoples of opposite values together you know it means that you uh, you you like to suffer because it's a terrible, terribly difficult job normally to do. But he took it on very bravely and he uh, brought people together. He wanted to, he urged all both sides of the religious and irreligious communities, Jewish communities, to become more involved in the idea of tikkun olam or rectification of the world, asking social questions and uh, and so on. He was also a vegetarian and he wrote a fantastic piece which is known as one of the greatest uh, examples of um, promotive writing on vegetarianism. It was called A, um, a Vision of Vegetarianism in a Peace which he wrote in his lifetime but Posthumously, his secretary and chief disciple, Rabbi David Cohen, who was known as a very holy man, who was known as the Nazir of Jerusalem, edited this piece that he wrote. Now, uh, the original piece is about 50 plus pages long, but for the sake of brevity, I've compiled excerpts from this A Vision of Vegetarianism and Peace, which Rav Cook wrote, which deals with various aspects of the animal welfare and the laws regarding consumption of meat. Now, Rav Cook contended that the Torah's permission to eat meat was only a temporary concession. He found it um, unthinkable that God would bind man with animal as predator and prey, so to speak. And uh, just an excerpt outside of this pamphlet that I'm going to read, I'm going to just give you his views on that, that, that uh, mindset. So he says, It is impossible to imagine that the master of all that transpires, who has mercy upon all his creatures, would establish an, an eternal decree such as this in the creation that he pronounced exceedingly good, that it should be impossible for the human race to exist without violating its own moral instincts by shedding blood, be it even the blood of animals. So uh, Rav Cook um, <clears throat> lays out his uh, vision for an evolution of consciousness 
um, he believed that it was just a, the consumption of meat was a stepping stone between uh, levels of consciousness. And he, um, he was of the opinion that the desire for meat would uh, eventually, with the evolution of, a, of, of man's consciousness, uh, would become redundant as higher levels of enlightenment became obvious to mankind. Um, so I'm going to read excerpts from each uh, or uh, an assortment of chapters within this uh, composition, A Vision of Vegetarianism and Peace. So chapter one, chapter one deals with the just treatment of animals. And Rav Cook begins. There is a fundamental part of a lofty, humane and progressive sensibility that according to the present state of the prevailing culture, exists today only in the pleasant dream of a few extremely idealistic souls, an innate ethical striving, a feeling for what is humane and just, to consider the rights of animals with all that this entails. Certain cruel philosophies, especially those that are denied belief in God, according to their views on human ethics based upon reason, have advocated that man completely stifle within himself any sense of justice for animals. However, they have not succeeded, nor shall they succeed, with all their self-serving cleverness in perverting the innate sense of justice that the Creator planted within the human soul. Although sympathy for animals is like the glow of a smouldering ember buried under a great heap of ashes, Nevertheless, it is impossible for them to negate this sensitivity within every feeling heart. For, as a rule, the lack of morality among all humanity consists in failing to heed the good and noble instinct not to take any form of life, whether for one's needs or physical gratification. Our sages did not agree with these philosophical views. They tell us that the holy Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was visited with afflictions because he told a calf being led to slaughter that had sought refuge in the skirts of his garment, Go, this is the purpose for which you were created. His healing, too, was brought about by a deed when he showed mercy to some weasels. This is from Baba Metzia 85 Ahmed Aleph. They did not conduct themselves like the philosophers who exchanged darkness for light for the sake of pragmatism. It is impossible to imagine that the master of all that transpires, who has mercy upon all his creatures, would establish an eternal decree such as this in the creation that he pronounced exceedingly good, that it should be impossible for the human race to exist without violating its own moral instincts by shedding blood, be it even the blood of animals. Chapter 2. Man's original diet was vegetarian. There can be no doubt in the mind of any intelligent thinking person that when the Torah instructs humankind to dominate, and I quote, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. That's from Genesis 1 verse 28. It does not mean the domination of a harsh ruler who afflicts his people and servants merely to fulfill his personal women desire according to the crookedness of his heart. It is unthinkable that the Torah would impose such a decree of servitude sealed for all eternity upon the world of God, who is, and I quote, good to all, and his mercy is upon all his works, from Psalms 145 verse 9, and who declared, also from Psalms 89 verse 3, the world shall be built upon kindness. Moreover, the Torah attests that all humanity once possessed this lofty moral level, 
citing scriptural proofs, our sages explain in Sanhedrin 57a that Adam was not permitted to eat meat. And I quote from Genesis 1 verse 29, Behold, I have given you every tree yielding seed for food. Eating meat was permitted for the children of Noah only after the flood. Also quoted from Genesis chapter 9 verse 3, Like the green herb, I have given you everything. Is it conceivable that this moral excellence, which once existed as an inherent human characteristic, should be lost forever? Concerning these and similar matters, it states, and I quote from Job 36 verse 3, I shall bring knowledge from afar, and unto my maker I shall ascribe righteousness. In the future, God shall cause us to make great spiritual strides, and thus extricate us from this complex question. Chapter 12 Vegetarianism and Enlightenment When humanity reaches its goal of complete happiness and spiritual liberation, when it attains that lofty peak of perfection that is the pure knowledge of God and the full manifestation of the essential holiness of life, then the age of motivation by virtue of enlightenment will have arrived. This is like a structure built on the foundation of motivation by virtue of the law, which of necessity must pre precede that of motivation by virtue of enlightenment for all humanity. Then human beings will recognize their companions in creation. All the animals and they will understand how it is fitting from the standpoint of the purest ethical standard not to resort to moral concessions, to compromise the divine attribute of justice with that of mercy. For they will no longer need extenuating concessions, as in those matters of which the Talmud states, and I quote from Kiddushin 31b, the Torah speaks only of the evil inclination. Rather, they will walk the path of absolute good. As the prophet declares, I will make a covenant for them with the animals of the field, the birds of the air, and the creeping things of the ground. I will also banish the bow and sword and war from the land, and I will cause them to rest in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. And I will betroth you to me with righteousness, with justice, with kindness, and with compassion. And I will betroth you to me with faith, and you will know God. That's from the prophet Hosea, chapter 2, verse 20. Shechita, humane slaughter. The act of slaughter, or Shechita, must be sanctified in a unique manner. And I quote, as I have commanded you, end quote, with a minimum of pain to the animal. Thus, the person who takes to heart the fact that this is a sentient being, he is not involved with a random object that moves about like an automaton, but with a living, feeling creature. He must become attuned to its senses, even to its emotions, to the feeling it has for the life of its family members, and to its compassion for its own offspring. Thus, it is biblically forbidden to kill the mother bird with her children on the same day, or to slaughter a calf before it is eight days old. And it is a positive precept to send away the mother bird before taking her young. Chapter 17 Covering the Blood I quote If any one of the children of Israel or a convert who joins them traps an animal or bird that may be eaten and spills its blood, he must cover the blood with earth. Leviticus 17 verse 13 the obligation to cover the blood teaches us to see the shedding of a non-domestic animal's blood as an act akin to murder. Thus, we should be ashamed to shed the blood of a domestic animal as well. 
it was not deemed necessary to cover the blood of a domestic animal because it is slaughtered in an area where people are commonly found. Thus, it is preferable to leave the blood of the animal in plain sight, that it may remind others that slaughtering an animal is like murder. This is not the case with a non-domestic animal and birds that are trapped and slaughtered far from human habitation, whose blood is not seen. Here, by contrast, the obligation of covering the blood teaches us that this is a shameful act. Chapter 20. Do not cook meat and milk together. Quoted from Exodus 23 verse 19. The first of the new produce of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. The mother animal does not live so that a person, simply by his right of ownership, may exploit her for his own purposes. Rather, her milk is intended for her own young, whom she loves. The kid, too, is entitled by its natural disposition to the pleasure of its mother's loving breast. However, the cruelty of the human heart, produced by our coarse materialism and moral weakness, distorts and perverts these principles. Thus, the tender kid, according to the assessment of man's inferior ethical sensitivity, has no right to nestle against its loving mother, nor to enjoy the light of life, but deserves only to be slaughtered in order to provide food for the bellies of gluttonous human beings, whose debased souls insist, I will eat meat. According to this, what should be the purpose of the milk, if not to cook in it the slaughtered kid? Is this not a natural combination of these two essential foods, the milk and the tender kid that derives nurture from it? However, humanity, let your ears hear something behind you, the voice of God that loudly cries out, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. No, the purpose of the kid is not merely to be food for your sharp teeth, sharpened and polished by your lowliness and gluttony in eating meat. And certainly the milk is not intended to be a condiment for the satisfaction of your base desire. Chapter 26. The Law of Trefa. And I quote from Exodus 22 verse 30. People of holiness you shall be unto me. You shall not eat the flesh of an animal that was torn in the field. Distinctive among the traits of Israel is the compassion that waits to blossom into manifestation from amidst the feelings of the pure-hearted, and spread from humanity to all living creatures. This compassion is nascent within the prohibition of eating nevela, which is an animal that has died as a result of sickness, or a trefa, an animal that has died as a result of bodily injury. Just as we naturally feel greater pity for sick or injured human beings than we feel for the healthy, the unfortunate injured animal deserves our additional sympathy. Having internalized the ethical implications of the Torah's prohibition of eating the flesh of a torn animal, our hearts can fully experience the spirit of enlightenment that relates to the precept of visiting the sick, prompting us to relieve their distress. The commonality that exists between our feelings of compassion for both animals and human beings also expresses itself in connection with the need to guard our health, both spiritually and physically, and in not putting ourselves on the same plane as the predatory beasts. Rather, the Torah imposes upon us the further obligation to bring about their good, to benefit and to enlighten them. How could we consume the trefa lying in the field, which would appear like dividing the spoil with the wild beasts, and constitute a tacit approval of their predatory habits? It is true that, among the various categories of trefa discussed by the Talmudic sages, we must distinguish between a mortally injured animal in the field and a terminally ill human being. 
However, the suffering of both creatures calls for our compassion, which initially should be awakened on behalf of the wretched and the outcast. The law of the animal that died as a result of sickness prepares the heart to feel even greater repugnance towards exploiting the misfortune of other creatures in the event of their deaths. This sensitivity signals a sense of comradeship, sharing another's pain, and our having entered the borders of their inner world. With this, the motivation by virtue of enlightenment will supersede the motivation by virtue of the law causing us to distance ourselves from committing any evil upon these, our comrades in the universe, since we all come forth from the hand of one creator, the master of all his works. Chapter 31. Animals during the Messianic Age. At the end of days, an inner thirst will prompt each person to search for someone upon whom to confer benevolence, upon whom to pour forth his overflowing spirit of kindness, but none will be found, for all humanity already will have attained happiness, living lives of delight, gratification and prosperity in every sense materially, ethically, and intellectually. Then, with all its store of wisdom, its collective insight and experience, humanity will turn toward its brothers on lower levels of creation, the mute and the downtrodden, including the animal kingdom. And they will seek means to share wisdom with them, to instruct and enlighten them according to their abilities thus to elevate them from level to level. There is no question that humanity will take an active part in this when the time comes to accomplish this mission. Beyond all doubt, humanity will share the enlightenment of the Torah with the animal kingdom, affecting their physical development and, all the more so, their ethical and spiritual development. This state of enlightenment will reach such a lofty level that we cannot imagine it at present, due to our lowliness and lack of wisdom. All beings shall receive a new exalted form, a new world. This is implied by the words of our sages, and he quotes from Sanhedrin 65b, if they so desired that Sadiqib could create a world. Chapter 32 the spiritual perfection of animals. As a consequence of their spiritual elevation in general, the lofty level attained by animals in the course of their development will also affect their senses and feelings, to attune and refine them. Indeed, a higher nature comes with this. And he quotes from Ishaya 30 verse 24. And the oxen and the young donkeys who work the soil shall eat enriched food that was winnowed with the shovel and with the fan. For according to the loftiness of their souls, the faculty of taste will be developed to a higher degree in sensitivity as befits their spiritual stature. With a still small voice does the wisdom of Israel, the Kabbalah, speak. The levels of animals in the future will partake of the level of humanity as it is today, due to the ascent of the worlds. This is the radiant vision the prophets disclose to us of the civilized state that will be attained by the predatory animals of today. And he quotes from Ishaya chapter 11 verses 6 through 9. And a wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and a leopard shall lie with a kid, and the calf and lion cub and the fatling together, and a small child shall lead them. And the heifer and the bear shall graze together, their young shall lie down together, and the lion like the ox shall eat straw, and an infant shall play over a viper's hole. And over the den of an adder shall a weaned child stretch forth his hand. They shall neither harm nor destroy in all my holy mountain, 
for the knowledge of God shall fill the earth as the water covers the sea. That's from Yeshaya chapter 11. So that concludes these excerpts of this magnificent work, A Vision of Vegetarianism and Peace by Rav Cook, edited by his disciple, Rabbi David Cohen, the Nazir of Jerusalem. And it's a beautiful composition that very comprehensively um, <clears throat> explains uh, the idea of compassion towards animals and our role in this world and our role towards our fellow partners in creation. And I think that speaks for itself. I'm not going to add anything more to that. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope that uh, you will join us for our next episode shortly. Thank you.